to St. Mark's. Welcome to St. Mark's. Welcome to St. Mark's. Glad you're here. Welcome to St. Mark's. Welcome to St. Mark's. Welcome to St. Mark's. Glad to have you here today. Good morning and welcome to worship, everyone. We are excited to see you, whether you're in person or online. Our mission here at St. Mark's is to connect faith and life. And right now we wanna connect with you and there are three ways to do that. Way number one to connect is going to our church center app. It'll take you directly to the digital communication card. Way number two is you can text hello SM to 94,000. And way number three, if you're old fashioned like me, you can grab a printed connection card and hand it to the ushers as you leave. We're so glad you're here and thanks for worshiping with us. Good morning, and welcome to worship. We're so pleased to have you with us today, and those of you online, a very special welcome to you as well. As we uh, celebrate today, one of the things, uh, we will be having communion today, and I'll give some instructions about that uh, when we get a little further. If you would prefer not to come up front here as we hand the wafers and so on to you, we do have those little communion kits available, and you're welcome to take it at your seat. Um, I did want to mention that our assisting ministers will have masks on, those handing you bread and wine, just because we're going to be in front of every single one of you. <laughs> so that's, that's why we're doing that today. But now I'm going to invite you to stand as we join together in our opening hymn.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May we pray, please. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Let's take a few moments to confess our sins to the Lord, first in the silence of our hearts, and then together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Father, we are humbled before you this morning, humbled that you have called us, humbled that you have loved us so unconditionally that you have sent your son Jesus to die for us. Help us when we doubt to have trust, to accept your grace that you freely give us. Our salvation is secured by Jesus, and your mercy and love for us is just so undescribable. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together the Alleluia verse. The gospel reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never in- enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such, one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, my name is Jason. I'm the director of worship here uh, Welcome to everyone online. Also, it's great to have everybody here. Besides being director of worship, I'm on also one of the pastoral interns with Michelle. Michelle and I have been taking uh, seminary courses together for almost three years now. Has it been three years since I, we've been doing I've it? lost track. <laughs> it's been, it's been a, uh, quite a while, and it's been a lot of fun. So we have an opportunity today to, to bring the message together, and we are continuing our series uh, entitled Since You Asked. And in this series, as some of you may know, we uh, have invited you to, to submit questions, and you all online have submitted questions, and we've taken those questions and compiled them, and the most common ones have, have bubbled to the surface, and we've taken those uh, topics and made those the, the message for Sunday morning. And today is no different, Michelle. Today is a, a very important question that I think, that I know I have, mm-hmm. uh, I know a lot of people probably have, many of us here in the room, is that, it, and that question is, uh, can I be saved even if I have doubts? Can I be saved even if I have doubts? And doubts are a, uh, an interesting topic, I feel, in church, especially as a topic of a message, because uh, doubts are, are, are a topic that we don't discuss very often. Exactly. I feel. We I feel, keep quiet about our doubts. <laughs> I feel like we, we don't really uh, address them, very often at least, if, if we do. And so today we're going to address some of those doubts a little bit, which should be a lot of fun for me. <laughs> and so uh, really when, when we talk about doubts, we talk about doubts in Christianity, doubts at church, uh, they come under two topics in my mind. And the first is, you know, is the, is the Bible real? Can I trust the things that it says? Did they happen? Are all these miracles real? Uh, uh, is God real? All, all these these fundamental questions, I think, that uh, many people have. And then if you're a part of the church and, and you've accepted on faith a lot of these things and, and by uh, evidence a lot of these things, uh, then the, the, the second question, the second doubt that we may have is, well, what about me? Is I think, Michelle, when we were uh, preparing this, you said that uh, the, the common question people have or the common when, when we say, am I going to get to go to heaven? How do I go to heaven? And the answer is always... So I, a lot of times you hear, I've been a really good person. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if I've been a really good person, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to heaven. And so we have then, if that's how you view your salvation is by you being a good person, then of course we're going to have doubts. I definitely have doubts if my salvation is contingent on me uh, being a good person. And my, my own faith journey really is... is uh, the pivot point for it was doubt. I was baptized Catholic. I went to a Catholic school, and in, in that Catholic school, we had religion class every day. We would go uh, and sit in a class and, and learn Sunday school and, and, and 
Lutheran uh, confirmation sort of things. We would learn that during school. That was, that was what we learned in, in class. And I remember sitting in religion class in third or fourth grade, and the teacher was talking about, you know, outlandish things that sounded to me in the Bible. We were talking about Adam and Eve and talking snakes, and I hear words like Philippians and Ephesians, and I don't understand any of those words. And uh, I just remember at that moment having doubts about, it was the first time I decided I was going to question some of these things in my own mind that, that I was being taught. And I kind of looked up and looked around the room, and it didn't appear to me at least that any of the other third or fourth graders were, were questioning any of these things. And it was never, uh, we were never asked if we had questions either. So I, I, I really struggled with, with having a faith that I wasn't allowed to question or engage with uh, mentally in any way. And so from that moment on, I basically lived I was an atheist, you know, and, until my late 30s when uh, uh, God showed me a, di- a different way and, and made himself known to me in a powerful way. And, and as we were preparing for, this, preparing for this, Michelle, you said that you also have these doubts. Yeah, that... and, and mine was actually just a couple weeks ago. Um, I, was, I was having an a overload of documentaries and podcasts of, about how of all the, the tragic things that are happening in the world right now. Um, you know, all right. the poverty, disasters, um, and just all the sadness. And then my, my inner Martha sort of bubbled up to the surface, and I was thinking, you know, th- through, through this pandemic, I haven't done much. I've sort of been on the sideline. And so that, that made me think of my worthiness. Am I, am I worthy because I'm not out solving these problems or doing anything to help with a solution for all the, the, the tragedy that we see in the country and, and in the world? And so um, when Pastor Paul asked us to do this, I mean, it was just, it was just at the right time because um, then dug into the Word and, and saw what... what um, is the truth about whether we have to earn our way and if we're good enough and, and doing enough for the kingdom. So this was a, a really great time in my life to actually be able to get up here and talk about this this morning. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So I'm a nerd, Michelle. And in true, in true nerd fashion, we have a graph. Can we put up this graph <laughs> that Kelly created for us? All right, so in the center, oh, it's kind of blown out here on the screen, but in the center we have faith and this horizontal axis uh, that we've titled the worldly axis. So on, on uh, the way that we envision ourselves, uh, our faith working and our salvation working is on one side of the spectrum, we have doubt. And that's sort of where, where we're living right now when we're discussing this, this doubt uh, side of the spectrum with those two categories of doubt about the Bible's validity and, and, and God's love for me as an individual. Those are the two main things I think that we really doubt. And then the opposite of that, if we go all the way to the right on the other side of, of the spectrum, we have No Doubt, which is not only a band with Gwen Stefani from the 90s, Michelle, <laughs> but it's also the opposite side of our spectrum. Do you want to talk about? Yeah, you're younger than I am. But um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, on the other side, we get No Doubt at all. But if we're really honest with, with each other, you know, I don't, I don't think that that side really exists because We've all had doubt sometime in our faith journey. And if you look at Scripture, you'll see that, that throughout the Old and New Testament, there are stories of people who had doubt. And when Jesus was, was in ministry, he, he performed all these miracles and fulfilled prophecy that people knew, but they still doubted him. And in his inner circle with the disciples, you had Thomas, whose nickname was Doubting Thomas. Ooh. And he needed proof when he saw Jesus resurrected that, that he indeed was the resurrected Messiah. So I don't, and I don't think you just need to look at Scripture to see. There's, there's plenty of examples in modern day that we see of Christians that have had doubt. And I found a couple. The first one is, is one person we all know is Mother Teresa. And in a letter she wrote, she said, Jesus has a very special love for you. But as for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and I do not see, listen and do not hear. The tongue moves in prayer but does not speak. 
And then from Pope Francis in a um, sermon that he gave, he said, who among us has not experienced insecurity, loss, and even doubts in our journey of faith? Everyone, we've all experienced this, me as well. It's part of the journey of faith and it's part of our lives. This should not surprise us because we are human beings marked by fragility and limitations. We are all weak, we all have limits, do not panic, we all have them. Michelle, I am disturbed and challenged (laughs) because we're talking about uh, the Pope and Mother Teresa and both uh, holding their doubts out in, in front of everyone to see. And if they have doubts and Mother Teresa is literally Mother Teresa and the Pope is literally the Pope, uh, where does that leave me? Well, you know, you think about we need to not stay stuck in our doubts, but instead concentrate on our faith, which is in the middle there. And, And where does our faith come from? If you look up top, our faith is from that grace that is given by God through the, solely, solely through the work of Jesus Christ. So all we have to do is receive it, but the, the problem, you know, that happens so often, and you see it with these stories I just said, is that we kind of wander away from that grace and go back to, to that plane that has doubts. And, and then it's whether we think we're not good enough or that we just can't accept that we can't earn our way because we're so just used, we're in a performance-based society that we live in that we need to not, you know, it's hard not to go back to those, those doubts we have that our grace is free. And so, but we know that there's proof of that and the proof we find in Scripture, and this is in, in Romans 3:22. Um, so if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, if you want to open up to Romans 3.22, Paul says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, but all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So, you know, all we have to do is just accept it and believe it. There's trust, Hmm. you know? But but trust can be a really uh, shaky thing. It's so easy um, to trust and have faith when things are going really good in our lives. But, you know, we have those times where things just go completely wrong, you know, whether it's by something that we've done or or just a circumstance we can't control. And those are times when our faith can be shaking. And as you're sitting here this morning, I'm sure you can think of a time in your life that you had that that feeling um, of not knowing what's going to come next. And is God going to see me through this? But as you sit here this morning, you have a different perspective. And if you look back on that time in your life, you can see that God's love and goodness and mercy really brought you through it, right? Awesome. And so, so we can be confident because God's faithfulness in our past should make us focus and, and, and believe and trust that he will be faithful in our future. That's awesome. That's awesome. And as it's comforting to hear that I don't have to do anything to earn my salvation, but it's still, it's hard for me to accept. And I think it's hard for everyone to accept the, the reality that we can't earn this because we, we're used to, if you want something, go out and earn it. Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of how, how we live our lives is, is by earning all of the things we want. And so just to have this gift, this gift of God's grace given to us through the work of Jesus Christ is is a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a new level of understanding. It is really just getting ourselves and our minds out 
of the worldly way of doing things, this transactional way that, that we uh, go about our lives. And just understanding that grace is, is a gift. Our salvation is a gift. We can't earn it. Uh, even as much as we feel like we need to, yeah. uh, we can't. It's impossible for us to, and that's why only God can do it through the work of his son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, th I think that's probably what Jesus was getting at when he's telling his disciples that you need to have the faith of a child. The child, the least among you, have the faith of a child. He's telling Nicodemus that you must be born again. You have to have this acceptance, acceptance of the, the gift that is given to you. And I want to tell a quick, quick story about uh, my kids. We used to have a Krispy Kreme here, if you remember, on Blair's Ferry that way. I think I'm pointing the right direction. Yes, John is nodding. Yep. John's been to Krispy Kreme before. <laughs> so there, we used to have a Krispy Kreme over there. When my teenagers were toddlers, we lived in Florida, and they had a couple of Krispy Kremes really close. And if you've ever uh, seen a Krispy Kreme donut shop, they have the red light that goes on in the window, and it says hot and ready. And so you know when that hot and ready sign comes on that inside they are making donuts, hot and ready, fresh donuts, and you can go in there and literally they pull them off the assembly line and you shove them in your face <laughs> as fast as you can. You have to pay for them, of course, but you just go eat <laughs> these, these donuts. They're fresh and, you know, they melt in your mouth and they're buttery and sweet and, and wonderful. So we used to do that as an activity. And uh, one morning my kids wanted to go to Krispy Kreme. And uh, I did not want to go because I'm lazy sometimes and I didn't want to take them to Krispy Kreme. And like I said, they're toddlers. So they're at that point in their life where they took naps. Those days are long gone, unfortunately. They don't nap anymore, but at that time they took naps. And uh, so I just turned to them and said, well, we can't go to Krispy Kreme because it's nap time at Krispy Kreme. And everyone is napping. So there's no donuts. The doors are closed. <laughs> the lights are off. Maybe after nap time they can, we can go. And they looked at me as uh, humans that take naps and accept the fact that naps are taken by everyone and said, okay, fair enough. They didn't fight it at all. They just accepted the fact that Krispy Kreme was closed because it was nap time. So is this the faith, the childlike faith that we're talking about? Uh, exactly. Michelle? You know, why, why can't we just accept it? Just accept hmm. that we don't have to earn our faith. Accept that we don't have to be good enough. Accept that what we've done in our past or, or what we're going to do in our f future doesn't affect. And, and, and it, we, if we can trust our, hev our earthly fathers, how much more can we trust our heavenly father? Um, and so we had talked earlier, I, I gave the story about, we we're talking about faith and, and talking about Mother Teresa. Yeah. And um, we talked about, you know, she had faith, she had doubts about her faith and uh, doubts about God's love for her. But, you know, she knew something. She knew that she could trust God, and there's a story that um, I want to share that sort of exemplifies her faith. And she, um, there was a, a, a Jesuit priest from St. Louis University that had traveled to Calcutta to the House of the Dying to, um, to work there for a month. And he had gotten there, and that morning he met with Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa wanted to know, she wanted to know, why did you travel all the way, you know, from the United States to um, see me here in Calcutta? And he said, I want you to pray for me. So that was a simple answer. I, I want, want you to pray for me, Mother Teresa. And she said, sure, what can I pray for you for? And he said, his response was, I want you to pray for clarity. And she responded back, that I, I cannot do. Of course, um, James Cavanaugh, the priest that was there, he, he was sort of confused. I mean, why is Mother Teresa telling me that she will not pray, you know, pray for me for that? And she said, you know, I cannot pray for clarity because that's the last thing you're clinging to and you must let that go. And he, he was still confused by it, you know, and, and he goes, I, I still don't understand. Um, you always seem that you have clarity, Mother Teresa. And that made her laugh, and she said, no, I have never had clarity ever. 
but what I have had is trust in God. And I pray that you trust God as well. That's awesome. Yeah. That's such a cool, such a cool uh, quote from Mother Teresa. And so we're wrapping this thing up. Our question was, uh, can I be saved if, you know, even if I have doubts? And of course the answer is yes. Uh, of course the answer is yes. Uh, faith is, is not the opposite of doubts. Uh, faith is the means to overcome your doubts. Uh, we all think that we need to be good enough to get into heaven. Uh, but uh, we, we're used to earning all our salvation, like I said before. But it's simple. But it's simple. And so we, Jesus, did, Jesus, Jesus did, did the work. All the work on the cross. <laughs> Jesus so did all the work. All we need so, to do is believe. Even if we're sitting here today thinking, I have doubts, and I'm not uh, tall enough, or I uh, have too many tattoos, or uh, my hair's too long, or my hair's too short, or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not a good father, I'm not a good mother, I'm not a good son, I'm not a good daughter. All these things that we put on ourselves and say, there's no way that God can love me, there's no way I'm saved, and there's no way that I'm going uh, to heaven. And so we're here this morning to tell you that your salvation doesn't depend on those things. Your salvation depends solely on the work of Jesus Christ. Your salvation depends solely on God's wisdom, God's love, God's mercy, God's understanding of who you are, God's love for you personally, God's love for his creation, God's love for the world, and God wants you to be saved. God wants you to spend eternity with him, and that is why he sent his son. Our salvation comes through, by grace, through faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Well Amen. said. Will you pray with me, Michelle? Yep. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Um, that you, you've done the work for us, God. That as imperfect as we are, we know that we are children of God if we believe, Lord. Just thank you for making that so simple for us. Help us not to get stuck in our doubts, but lean on this faith that we know that we are saved by your grace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand? I invite you now to join your voices and your hearts as we proclaim our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord God, great is your love toward us. Your faithfulness endures forever. We are so grateful for your presence with us. You are our helper and our refuge. Father, there are so many people in this world facing physical danger, hunger, despair. Bring help and comfort and strength to the people of Haiti as they face yet another hardship with the earthquake. Watch over those fleeing the war in Afghanistan. Bring peace and a good and just government to Syria. Lebanon, and to every nation on earth. Father, when the sick were brought to your, into your son's presence, they were healed. Bring healing to all who are facing the last days or weeks of their lives. Bring healing to all battling cancer. Help those struggling with addictions or mental illness or other emotional struggles. Father, we thank you for the work and ministry of Eight Days of Hope. 
We thank you for each of the volunteers who are working in your name to bring healing and restoration to this community. And Lord, we pray for our nation and for this troubled world as we continue to face the challenges of COVID-19 and so many other troubles. And Lord, we pray for your holy church, your holy church here in this place, but also for our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Reveal your will for us and give us the courage to follow you. We ask this, these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
now, children of God, as you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in our concluding hymn. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs>